Um, well, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Cindy Schmidtlein, and um, I would like to um, introduce you to Dr. Garrett Smith. Um, and Garrett is a, um, he's our presenter tonight. And Garrett is a geochemist currently working for the Montana DEQ's Hard Rock Mining Section in Helena, Mon uh, Montana. He's originally from New Mexico and he returned to his ancestral roots in Montana to complete his undergraduate and graduate degrees at Montana Tech. Uh, with an early emphasis on stable isotope geochemistry, his project experience includes the hydrogeology of abandoned and active mines, characterization of geothermal systems, hard rock mine permitting, and public outreach. And prior to his current position, Garrett was an assistant research professor with the Montana Bureau of Mines and Geology in Butte, Montana. So thank you very much for um, presenting tonight, Garrett. And I guess you can, um, if you're ready, you can go ahead and take control and um, start the presentation. Perfect. Yeah, thank you so much. And, and thank you for having me. This is, a, this is a real honor for me. I'll give you a little background uh, as I pull up my slideshow here. This is a presentation that I've given uh, at various symposiums and, and conferences around Montana. And so I, I hope it's not uh, too mining heavy. I, I, I tried to include some, some mineral and rock images. I'll try to give you some geology background for some of these sites. Uh, and we can certainly uh, go through some questions at the end. So this is an update. Uh, I go through this about every year to every two years and try to include new site photos. And I'll give you an idea about what's going on around the state. So many thanks to you, the Mineralogical Society of the District of Columbia. Uh, many thanks to the section staff that, that helped me put these photos together, all the mine operators. I try to cite all of the, the publications and images and maps that I use accordingly. Uh, so those are within my slides. And a quick disclaimer that I always throw out here is that this, this presentation is really for information purposes. Uh, this is something that I do out of interest and I'm not trying to uh, promote any particular companies. I'm not trying to give you any investment advice. I really advise against making any decisions based upon what I tell you this evening. So uh, buyer beware. Give you a little understanding of how Montana DEQ is set up. The Department of Environmental Quality is split into uh, many divisions here. Uh, I work in the Air, Energy, and Mining Division, specifically in the Mining Bureau. And our, our bureau is split up into the Hard Rock Mines, Open Cut, which includes our sand and gravel uh, pit type operations. We also have a coal mining section. And then we have a group that does all the field services uh, and they help with our technology uh, as needed. I also highlight these other programs in green, our public information officers and what's called MEPA. This is a, the Montana Environmental Policy Act. And that means that when we're making uh, permit decisions and releasing environmental impact statements, these are going out for public review. We're working with other federal agencies. And as you might uh, imagine, some mining projects are very controversial. So we're, we're in the news frequently and we have a lot of uh, public engagement. The Hard Rock Mining section uh, has the authority to regulate exploration and development of basically any mineral substance except for the, the short list here. So things like bentonite, clay, sand, gravel, soil, that falls under our open cut program. And our coal program handles uh, obviously the, the coal mines. Uh, we do not regulate or adjudicate things like air quality, uh, labor laws. Uh, you can go out and do some hobby mining or prospecting, panning, things like that. You don't need a permit for that activity. Uh, we also do not regulate mining on tribal lands. And we have uh, a handful of fairly large tribal reservations in Montana. Uh, we also don't regulate site safety. So when we do site inspections, we're not acting like MSHA. We're not looking for safety violations. We're really looking at environmental aspects of the operations. So our responsibilities come from the Metal Mine Reclamation Act. And that means that we're going to issue decisions about permit applications and, and modifications to existing permits. We make sure that minerals are developed with protection uh, for other resources. That often includes other departments and other agencies. We review annual reports and renewals. We go out and conduct annual site inspections. And then we also have uh, what's called a performance bond or reclamation bond. 
And this is a financial assurance that we have that money that's posted with the state to guarantee that reclamation activities are done in case the mine operator doesn't do it. So I'll give you a little background about the permitting categories, and then we'll really dive into some of the site photos and, and descriptions of these sites. At a very small scale, you have the option to, to apply for a small minor exclusion. And this actually isn't a permit or a state action, but uh, kind of an exemption. If you're less than five acres of disturbance, you can have up to two of these very small sites uh, you don't have any kind of application or review. It's just a statement that uh, explaining what you want to do and that you won't pollute air, water, air or water quality. There's very little bonding associated with these projects. We don't have to do that environmental analysis like we do for very large projects. And these are very short to process, usually 30 days or less. The in-between category is the exploration license. And this, is, this can involve surface drilling, underground exploration, trenching, various activities to collect samples for, for testing. These plans usually require a reclamation plan. Uh, we also get annual renewals and fees from them. And we also hold whatever performance bond, whatever money is necessary to make sure that they reclaim whatever disturbance they do by, by doing exploration. And we will also have to go through an environmental review. So this is either an environmental assessment or an environmental impact statement. And that's a public document that explains what the project would do and that the potential outcomes and impacts. There's public feedback at all stages of the, the development of those documents. Depending on how complex these projects are, they can take months to years to permit, particularly if there are federal agencies like the Forest Service or the Bureau of Land Management involved. The other category, and this is the, the group that I'm most familiar with, that I work on daily, are the operating permits. And these are large mines, basically capture every other kind of mining activity. They have to have robust operating and reclamation plans. There's annual reporting and fees. Again, there's bonding required for these operations. Uh, we go through an environmental assessment with a, with a caveat, I'll get to that. And these can take years to decades to complete depending on how complex those projects are. So some recent legislative changes we went through in 2021. Uh, the act that we work under is called the Metal Mine Reclamation Act. Was, so as you might imagine, it's kind of focused on metal mining and some of the impacts from that. And we recognize that there are a lot of other materials in Montana, particularly rock products. And this can include things like aggregate, uh, building stone, uh, decorative rock, things that are usually uh, produced by shallow quarrying. And so we have kind of a separate permitting category now for these rock products. And that's because they're very unlikely to contain sulfide minerals or, or other elements or uh, minerals that'll produce acidic runoff or other uh, kind of pollutive solutions. This does not include some of the industrial minerals or the, the metal ores that we have in Montana. So this is a special category. And the legislature did this because they recognize that there's there are fewer potential impacts from rock product mining. These rocks are typically sold and used in their natural state. They might be crushed or cut, but they're usually not chemically processed or refined. Th these operations typically don't affect water quality or water quantity. So there's kind of a, a streamlined permitting process for these kinds of operations now. There are a few limitations though. They have to be less than 100 acres. They can't impact or operate uh, near water resources. And then there's some stipulations about the kind of activity and disturbance they can create. So that kind of sets the stage. It's kind of the boring uh, legal background or framework for our regulations, but it helps guide the decision-making that we, that we have. So this map here shows you the distribution of our hard rock permits. Uh, in orange are those large operating permit sites. Exploration are in green squares. And then the pink diamonds are the small minor exclusion sites. A couple of things to note in this, in this slide it kind of follows the topography. And you look at the, the land image here, the Western third of the state is, is very mountainous, uh, a lot of changing terrain. There's a lot of volcanic rocks, metamorphic rocks, uh, very interesting kind of ore deposits and rock types in the, in the Western third here. And that's where we see a lot of the mining activity. In the central third of the state, we have some rolling plains, but then also these few a kind of island mountain change, these intrusions uh, where we do see some more mineralization and, and different mineral commodities. 
And out here in the eastern third of the state, it's, it's fairly flat, a lot of sedimentary units, a lot of undisturbed stratigraphy. So that's where we see a lot more of the, the coal production, the oil and gas, and some of those commodities are in the eastern portion, and we don't have as many hard rock sites. Um, but when we do our annual inspections, we really try to cover as many of these as we can. And we are all based here in Helena in the capital. So there's uh, quite a bit of driving. Montana is a very large state. Um, I should also point out that there's only six of us in our section uh, to cover all of these sites. So we, we definitely have our work cut out for us. So I'll give you a breakdown of our operating permits by commodity. Um, so this tall column here is the rock products. We have uh, almost 200 project sites. Uh, base metals, only around seven. Gold and silver mines, about 15. Then we have some of our industrial minerals like limestone, cement, and talc. We do have some platinum and palladium mines and associated facilities. Uh, we have a few garnet operations and sapphire operations, as well as some custom mills and a few miscellaneous things. And the way our program is set up, we have a individual permit numbers that are issued. So we have 72 permits, but for a particular permit, you might be able to, to mine or disturb multiple areas. If you have a rock product operation, you might have a quarry that produces red rock and a quarry that produces gray or green or black rock. So you can mine these different areas depending on what you're looking for and what you need at the time within your, your multi-site permit. This can also include facilities like uh, processing plants, disposal areas. And if you have any kind of loadout site at a, at a rail yard or at the highway uh, interface for loading out material, that would also cover a project site. So this really shows the number of locations that we're going to each year. And now let's compare the permitted sites to active sites. And this is based on 2021 inspections. You know, how many of these sites are actually in operation and in, in mining actively? Uh, so we see it's considerably fewer of the rock products. And like I mentioned, they're often going out looking for a specific type of stone for a uh, particular purpose. So they may not go to all of the locations needed. Another interesting thing is that our base metals, so you know, copper, lead, zinc, those type of mines, as well as our gold and silver mines uh, are really not in production. Many of those sites are in closure or reclamation but we do have a few active metal mines, whereas nearly all of our industrial mineral sites are still active, including the platinum group metals. And again, this change is based on economics, uh, commodity prices, demand, um, and then also, you know, just basically, you know, company stability in, in some cases. So from here on out, let's see how I'm doing on time. We've got plenty of time to go through a lot of site photos. Um, I'm going to throw a lot of information at you. So uh, hold on to your hats. This first image here uh, is from Butte, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later. Uh, but this is a, a picture of a copper precipitation facility. Here in the center of the screen is a facility where they have scrap metal, basically iron. They uh, have acidic seepage water around the area. They collect that water. They pour it on top of the scrap iron, uh, and this copper precipitates out of the water onto the scrap metal. It, it plates out. And then they, they gather the copper and add that to their, their copper mining operation. So we'll get, we'll get into that more soon. I wanted to throw in a few examples of exploration projects to give you a sense of what that looks like. Uh, here's a program being run by Kennecott right now. They're looking for copper in a couple of different places. Uh, down here in the bottom of the screen, I have a map and I've added red dots just to kind of give you an idea of where we are in the state as I hop around and show you all these photos. So they have a couple of operations, one near Phillipsburg, uh, the Northern Dot here, and then one near Silver Star. And this would be kind of a multi-elemental copper deposit that, that they're looking for. Uh, another interesting project is Group 10 Metals. They're down here in the Southern Central part of the state. They're looking for platinum, palladium, rhodium, and then some other uh, related mineralization down here in what we call the Stillwater Complex. And this is a drilling operation where they're supported by helicopter because the, the access roads are very difficult and uh, they're working in very remote areas. In Butte, just to the south of where I am here, uh, there's a new exploration project called Blackjack Silver. And this consists of surface drilling at these green dots. And they're also gonna be going underground to do some drilling in an existing portal. 
So I'm going to spend a little time talking about Butte mining history. Uh, it's really an important area in terms of Montana history and, and really mining across the world uh, with some of the technology developed here. What you'll notice is you know, there's these mining areas that are proposed are within claims that are right in the middle of town. These are neighborhoods and homes surrounding all of these areas. There's also a very large mining disturbance here on the east side to the right of the figure. And I'll talk more about that, but that's a, an active mine operation, but also part of uh, one of the largest contaminated Superfund sites in the country. So mining in Butte really started in the 1860s. They were first looking for gold that transitioned into a silver mining phase. And by the late 1800s, they had discovered copper. And for the next uh, hundred years, it was a, a fairly prominent copper player. And this image from the Bureau of Mines and Geology gives you an idea about the extent of the underground workings. So these are shafts, adits, tunnels. Uh, they're all kind of interconnected. And they're following the mineral zones of this large porphyry system uh, in Butte. So here in the center, we have the central zone. There are a lot of copper sulfides, uh, copper iron sulfides, some really beautiful specimens. A little bit further out to the west is the intermediate zone. And that's where you see some of the, the silver lead zinc uh, minerals come into play. And then further out, we have things like rhodochrosite, again, some of the, the sphalerite and galena. Um, the water quality also kind of occurs in zones. So when you look at groundwater in this area, uh, there's, there's different heavy metals and different water chemistry signatures based on these, these minerals. The other thing that I should point out here is uh, in the 1950s, after you know, decades of underground mining, they recognized just the, the dense mineralization here uh, around what is now the Berkeley pit. So this transition from underground mining to open pit mining, and they basically excavated everything in the footprint that you see here as the Berkeley pit. So here's the, kind of the same concept in cross-section. And so this shows you in 3D the extent of the underground workings underneath the town of Butte. Um, you can see the vertical shafts here and then all of the horizontal drifts going down. These lowest workings are approximately a mile below surface. So Butte is at about a mile high elevation. So at the bottom of these mines, you are at approximately sea level. And you can also see kind of the, uh, there's a shell here. Uh, there's a gray polygon or a gray blob that kind of sticks out below the land surface. And that's actually the Berkeley pit that shows you uh, where those workings were taken out by the open pit mining that, that followed. So here's some examples of the minerals that come from Butte. Um, a few of these mines in the central zone are particularly famous for their covalite, bornite, uh, a lot of really nice copper sulfides. Some beautiful uh, examples of rhodochrosite come from the, the intermediate or the western parts of town. Um, and then there's a few, you know, copper arsenic minerals like Energite here. Um, there's just a, there's a wide range of, again, ore zones. So you get a lot of different types of minerals. And as, as I look around Mindat.org and, and other sites online, it's really incredible just how many large uh, museum quality specimens were collected in Butte, uh, primarily in the underground mining days. Uh, that was a it was a big thing for miners to to take some of these specimens out, and we can track the provenance of of all these samples from a particular person and their lunchbox, you know, getting it to the shop in town. And there are quite a few mineral shops in Butte as well. So that's a bit of the historic mining perspective, and I'm going to talk now about the current mining operations. So this is looking south across the Continental Pit. Uh, you can kind of see the edge of some of the neighborhoods here, right at the edge of the mine. And an overview of the site here uh, will show that here's that Berkeley pit that I mentioned. This is that, that old pit that was mined from the 1950s to the 1970s. It is now filled in with groundwater and it's very acidic groundwater. And we'll talk more about that soon, but that kind of sets the stage for one of the things at the site. The continental pit to the right of that is the active mining area and they produce a copper and molybdenum ore, uh, a combination ore from that uh, pit. Their milling and, and processing facilities are at the south end, just south of the Berkeley pit. And then uh, the tailings are the crushed rock when they, they produce their copper concentrate, the, the tailings are put in a pipeline and they're piped way uphill 
It's about a mile to the north and a thousand feet in elevation change. They pump their tailings up into this impoundment, this tailings dam. The, the water separates from the, the tailings solids and there's a pond at the north end of that facility. And I mentioned the, the copper recovery, the precipitation area is kind of here in the middle, what they call horseshoe bend. The mineralization in Butte is, is really fascinating. And this is showing some of the older stage, the, the, the primary stage mineralization. It's kind of a, a copper a molybdenum porphyry system. And what's interesting is there's a large fault that, that cuts through a portion of town called the Continental Fault. And the Continental Pit is actually here, kind of mining that upper portion near the fault. And then uh, the Berkeley Pit is further to the west. And what we see is that the same uh, shell, the same zone that's being mined in the Continental Pit actually occurs much further down beneath the Berkeley. And it seems unlikely at this stage that they will ever mine that deep, but it, it gives us an idea that there's still a, a massive amount of potential ore in Butte that has yet to be mined. Another thing to point out is there is a, an enrichment zone that's shown in red, and I'll, I'll show some examples of that. But this is basically where those upper, historically there were upper sulfide minerals that, that weathered and oxidized, and it created this band of, of enriched copper, and that was a very um, profitable ore. So here's a photo of some of the ore. It, it, it's a granite, basically, a, a quartz monzonite, um, and it contains pyrite, chalcopyrite, which is kind of a, a dominant copper mineral there. And in some areas, you also see uh, chalcocyte, which is another uh, copper sulfide. And that in this case, it's kind of a gray or sooty coating. There's not really good uh, chalcocyte uh, crystal or grains to see here. Here's a sample of some copper oxides. And as I mentioned, this is from an, an upper oxidized zone. And here's a little cross-section schematic of what's going on where we had this ore body that was leached and weathered uh, above the water table. And then down below, you can still have a reduced condition where these sulfides occur. But this blue-green copper oxide sample is, is gonna come from this oxidized zone right above the water table. So I mentioned the acidic groundwater that has filled in the Berkeley pit. So now there's a very large lake in the Berkeley pit. And that acidic water is because of the pyrite. So here's a sample of, of that uh, pyrite in a silica matrix. And uh, as some of you may know, pyrite can be very reactive with water and air under the right conditions. And it will produce uh, dissolved iron and also sulfuric acid. So that leads to acidification of, of the groundwater and storm water that interacts with this rock within the pit. And to give you an idea about the water chemistry, um, the pH is just a little below four right now, although historically the pH was closer to two and a half to three. So it was more acidic historically. It still has very high sulfate concentrations. The iron is a bit low and that's because the pH has gone up. The iron has precipitated um, so there's probably a large thick layer of iron sludge at the bottom of the lake from all this iron that's dropped out over the years. And it has very high total dissolved solids. It's very uh, salty water. Here's a photo of the Berkeley pit. Um, as I mentioned, this is a part of a super fun site. So even though there is an active copper mine next door, they're also doing water management to control and, and limit the amount of pollution that reaches groundwater and surface water outside the mine. So they're constantly pumping the water level down in this lake so that it, it basically doesn't leave the pit. And in 2019, they started a new pumping program. So the lake used to rise at six feet a year, the water level was rising, but now they're pumping it at the same inflow rate. So the water level is staying static. It's not rising any longer. They're pumping that water out, uh, they're recovering the copper, and then it goes through water treatment before it's discharged to a nearby stream. And they've been meeting the compliance criteria for all of that discharge. This is a, this is a really big accomplishment that it's taken many years of Superfund uh, negotiations and payments and, and lawsuits to, to settle some of these issues. So the, the water treatment program is, is now in effect. Something else we've done for the, the current mining operation just recently, they needed to raise the embankment basically the dam that goes around their tailings facility, what you see in orange and red here on the screen. 
they needed to raise this up another 50 feet and that would give them about another 10 years of storage for tailings. We just recently passed new legislation uh, about tailings impoundments, the level of engineering review and a design and safety measures that must go into these facilities. So this was a very good example to implement the, the new laws about tailings dam safety. Here's a photo of the, the tailings beach, this, this wide expanse of, of very silty fine grain tailings with that pond at the north end. And here's an image that shows the western dam embankment. Uh, again, over time, the tailings will fill and rise up to meet this, the crest of the dam there. All right, so we're gonna move away from Butte now. Uh, we're gonna go just over the Continental Divide to a town called Whitehall, shown here with the red dot. And this is a, a gold mine that's currently operated by Barrick. And here's a, here's a high wall uh, just behind their mill building here in the foreground. This is the Mineral Hill Pit. So the mineralization at Golden Sunlight, uh, this is kind of interesting. We have a, a very old uh, middle Proterozoic shale, uh, the La Hood Formation that's kind of here at an angle. And then we have this Cretaceous breccia pipe, basically this, this intrusion that came in uh, and, and ruptured that area. And it's really that breccia pipe where the mineralization occurs. It's all those, those hot fluids, those gold bearing fluids uh, that, that moved along this area. So the, the gray bands here along the edge of that breccia pipe uh, is where the mineralization occurs. And then there's a fault, uh, a little bit younger, maybe a tertiary fault here that's basically cut the top off and kind of slid the, the top of the breccia pipe uh, offset. And the pit basically you know, comes down, it's nearly perfectly conical and it cuts into that breccia pipe to access the, uh, the rich pyrite zones around the margin. So here's a photo of the Mineral Hill Pit. You can see some of the trucks and equipment down here in the bottom for scale. Uh, as I mentioned, it's kind of a conical pit and it tapered out, but they recognized that there was still substantial ore at depth. So they've, they've also mined this area through underground methods. And this gives you an idea of the extent of the underground workings at the bottom of the pit. Perhaps this is better visualized as a cross section and you can really see just the extent of these blue and green, work, blue and green workings uh, underneath the, the pit cone. Here's an example of some of the mineralization from underground. You can see, uh, you know, some of the sulfide minerals will follow the, the bedding planes of, of the uh, original shale or the, the La Hood formation there. And you can see it's broken and fractured. And in other areas, it's, it's even more brecciated. There's uh, you know, it's, it's almost a pyrite matrix in some areas. So as you would expect, that pyrite also has the potential to produce acid rock drainage. And we have uh, heavy metal contamination within the groundwater here. This bottom photo is just an example to show what uh, a drilling program would look like underground to give you the, the dimensions and scale of their underground workings. Here's some hand samples from the, actually probably very close to where those photos were taken. You can see uh, quartz veins and associated pyrite along some of the fractures here. And then in other areas, there's just massive pyrite. Um, I, I can't recall offhand some of the grades, but there's, it's predominantly gold uh, within the pyrite. There's trace amounts of silver. There are some telluride minerals, um, some bismuth minerals, um, and there, there's substantial literature out there about uh, this particular deposit. I'll caveat all this though, to say that mining actually ceased in 2019. Uh, they, they ran out to the end of their reserve life, at least what was accessible and, and safely accessible. So they stopped mining in the open pit and the underground by 2019. So the last two years, they've been doing a lot of site reclamation. That means that they're, they've got bulldozers out here, they're grading the waste rock dumps, they're applying soil, uh, they're adding seed and they're revegetating their rock dumps, they're managing water, and they're going through a reclamation program kind of at the end of the mine life. But there's a new project that just came through that would extend operations and breathe some life back into this facility. And what they proposed to do uh, in early 2021 was to reprocess their old tailings dam. So there's two tailings facilities, number one and number two. 
down here at the bottom of the screen. And what they proposed to do was to go in and dig out their old tailings and reprocess them. First of all, the, the facility did not have a liner. So there's seepage and groundwater impacts underneath the tailings dam. They also recognize there's a residual gold in the tailings, but those tailings also contain pyrite, which again is the source of contamination, but that pyrite is also a source of sulfur. So Barrick also runs mining operations in Nevada, and they are currently purchasing sulfur to help run some of their facilities and their, their roasters uh, in Nevada. So Barrick has proposed this project to basically reprocess the tailings, remove the sulfur, sell it to themselves at this other operation. And in the process, it's a big cleanup uh, project that would improve the site here at Golden Sunlight. So they would basically excavate it from the tailings facility, pump it into a, create a slurry and pump it up to their mill site. They would use a flotation system to separate out the pyrite from, from the other tails. And then the remaining tailings, that sandy fraction that's, that's not sent off site, would be used to backfill the pit. And I'll give you some images of that. So here's the top of the tailings facility today. It's been vegetated since the 90s, has a thick soil layer. Uh, there's a nearby rancher that grazes his cattle on top of this dam. And here's an image of the tailings. There's a trench that they dug that shows you this bottom, the gray portion, are the unoxidized, reduced, sulfide-rich tailings. There's a very thin oxidized zone, kind of this red band. And then above that is a thick soil layer. And that's what was supporting the reclamation. And I think this is really interesting because it shows us that over the course of two decades, the plants and the reclamation cap were fairly effective at preventing deep oxidation and deep contamination of, from these tailings. We see a very thin uh, oxidation horizon. So that shows that the reclamation method was really performing as intended. But over the very long time scales, they recognized that there was still potential for this material to react. So uh, there is still some long-term benefit to removing this material. And as I mentioned, what they proposed to do is to, to process these tailings in their flotation plant. Uh, they'll reduce the sulfur content of the residual tailings going into the pit. And then they'll be able to uh, kind of backfill and reclaim the pit bottom through the process. Something else that they have to do is pump groundwater. So they're not permitted to create a Berkeley pit lake. So I should backtrack. The Berkeley pit lake that we saw previously uh, occurred before modern mine permitting. So it was kind of a, a legacy impact. And here at Golden Sunlight, they're not allowed to create a pit lake. So they have to uh, dewater and pump the groundwater out through a well. That water then goes to water treatment. And they have to continue that process uh, basically in perpetuity and, and have water management on site. And this dewatering well is completed into some of the underground workings. So as the pit is filling with tailings, they'll extend the dewatering well and the access road so they can continue compliance and continue to pump groundwater even underneath what will, this is what ultimately what the pit would look like. It would be a flat surface in the bottom of the pit that would be reclaimed and there would be an access road leading to the well so that they could continue their water management requirements. They also expect that this will help improve water quality in the pit though. They'll be adding lime and thickening the tailings uh, so it will probably improve the water quality that they're collecting. The other component of this that's really important is that they're gonna go back and regrade and reclaim the footprint of the old tailings impoundment. So once the tailings are gone, these cross sections show you the existing dam surface is kind of this flat feature and the native ground is underneath. So once they've removed the tailings, they'll be reclaiming the land surface back to the drainage patterns that it had once before. All right, we're gonna switch gears once again here. We're gonna to go to the Stillwater Complex. This is currently operated by Sabanya Stillwater and Sabanya is a South African platinum palladium producer. They recently merged. This is an underground mine. You can see a couple of, uh, of adits here, a couple portals. Uh, also point out just the heavily forested landscape around the mine. Uh, this is in kind of a remote part of the, the South central part of the state up on the Beartooth Plateau. This is a very high elevation country. 
Uh, some of you may be familiar with the Stillwater complex. This has been highly studied. It's a very interesting uh, mafic layered intrusion. Um, but just to give you an idea, there's the ore zone that they're after, what's called the JM Reef, is very rich in platinum and palladium minerals. And it extends approximately 20 miles from east to west uh, as a part of this, this complex banded series. The East Boulder mine that I just showed you, the, those portals, that's kind of located here on the west end of the deposit. They also operate a mine called the Stillwater Mine near the town of Nye on the east end. And they're basically mining this deposit from the two opposite ends. And eventually they'll meet in the middle. As I mentioned before, there's another company doing some exploration kind of on the outskirts of this district. They think there's some similar mineralization there as well. So Stillwater isn't the only company looking at this area. Here's kind of a simplified uh, cross-section or explanation of the formation from the Stillwater Company. But basically this is a approximately two and a half billion year old intrusion. There was a slow cooling and crystallization process. Uh, and so we get these, these bands or layers in the rock. And there's a particular zone that's very rich in platinum and palladium minerals. There are also other uh, sulfide minerals. There's nickel sulfide, there's chromium associated with this deposit. Um, and here's a sample of ore from that JM reef. Uh, it's not particularly, you know, I don't, I've not seen a lot of beautiful specimens from this mine. A lot of times these uh, platinum and palladium sulfides are kind of intermixed with, with other metals. And we see very small occurrences or coatings of these sulfide minerals. So I think that this rock sample is, is very representative of, this is what it looks like underground. And uh, I have not seen many uh, impressive museum quality pieces out of the mine. I will point out though, that this is uh, more dominant in palladium than platinum. Uh, and right now the price of palladium is quite a bit higher than platinum. So they're, they're doing well in that sense. And this JM reef is only a few meters thick, but it extends a very long distance as I, as I pointed out. So a few activities there. Again, you know, they're, they're always looking at waste rock storage, tailings disposal. It's kind of similar to the Montana resources example. Uh, they've been expanding their tailings facility uh, out to stage six with the construction. And they're proposing to build a new tailings facility. So the current facility is the gray area on the right. The new facility would be the gray facility on the left. And then to the north on the upper part of the image would be a new waste rock dump. So we are currently in the process of reviewing this application. They've not been approved to build these new facilities, but as their underground operation continues for many decades forward, they're gonna to need to permit additional areas for their waste disposal that will then require reclamation. On the other end of that deposit, we'll jump over to the Stillwater mine near Nye. Uh, here's a picture of their tailings facility that they're actually capping and reclaiming right now. And the reason for that is they're they're sending their tailings to uh, a different facility further to the north, what we call the Hertzler facility. And so there's the mine down here at the bottom of that image, and they're pumping their tailings, uh, I think it's about five or six miles to the north to this Hertzler area. Another part of their operation is waste rock control. So they get seepage through the waste rock and they capture the water that comes out. It's on top of liners. So they have uh, liners underneath the facilities and you can see these multicolored stages to show the, the development and growth of their waste rock facility. Aha, uh -huh. so I'm seeing notes here. I'm gonna try to change my display settings. I'm really sorry about that. I've jumped so far ahead here. I hope. I hope that this is a little bit better view. Sorry, folks. All right. So we're gonna jump up to the Northwest corner of the state now. So this is near the Troy mine. This is a silver copper district that's up in the Northwest. It's in the Belt Rocks. And I'll talk more about that soon too. But the, the Troy mine uh, was operational through the 1980s, 90s. It went into closure just recently. So they're doing a lot of reclamation. They're demolishing buildings and they're, they're milling facilities. They're also reclaiming all of their 
uh, tailings facilities. So they're putting a cap and vegetation cover down uh, on top of their, um, so the tailings underneath, they've put soil, they've graded it. Now they're revegetating. And so this was a photo from 2018. And if I'll go ahead here to the next one, there's an image uh, from 2021 that shows you just the, the amount of time it takes. They, they get some vegetation cover in there. They'll soon be planting trees and shrubs and other vegetation to, to kind of match the landscape. And this is another facility where the tailings dam was separate from the underground mine. This is a large room and pillar operation. The next project I'll talk about uh, is the Black Butte Copper Project. And this would be an underground copper mine. It was proposed in 2017. We completed our EIS and we gave final permit approval in 2020. So this is a new project. It's not yet in, in development. Um, there's a little town called White Sulphur Springs here in central Montana. Here's the project location. And this has received a lot of attention because it's near uh, the Smith River, which is a tributary of the Missouri. It's highly prized for, for fishing and floating, and it's, it's a very beautiful area. Um, but this the, the copper mine would be located off of Sheep Creek, which is a tributary of the Smith. It's approximately 19 miles from the river. And as I mentioned, this would be an underground copper mine with a surface mill uh, attached. The permit area would be just under 2,000 acres, but a much smaller disturbance footprint. And I'll show you, this is an image of their proposed facilities. The underground portal would go into the hillside here. There would be support facilities, the mill building, waste rock storage, and the, some of the construction pads. The one thing that's really interesting about the site compared to the others we've looked at is they're proposing a tailings facility that would be cemented. So they would construct a tailings impoundment like a dam, like our, the other mines we've seen, but the tailings would go in, they would be thickened into a very thick paste and cement would be added to that. So as these tailings are deposited, they thicken and they harden and there's not a pond and there's, there's not a potential for this facility to fail or release any tailings because there's no water in the facility and that cemented mass cannot liquefy. It's very similar to cement backfill underground. And so they would be using the same technology underground in their workings. Here's a cross section that shows that portal coming in. There are basically two uh, copper zones that they would be targeting. There's the upper zone here in red, and there's a lower zone kind of below the, uh, what was shown as a fault here. And as mining continues, uh, as they mine out each stope or each panel where they get the copper sulfides, uh, they would be backfilling it with their tailings and that cemented backfill would set up. Uh, it would be competent like the bedrock next to it so they can mine in sequential panels across the deposit and basically fill in any void space that would have been left behind. And as I said, they're in very early construction phases. Uh, this was approved in 2020. So they're just now beginning some of the surface construction. I will also point out uh, because of the controversial nature of the project, as soon as we approved the permit, uh, we received a, a kind of a group class action lawsuit uh, against the state for permitting this project. So we're still going through litigation right now. They are permitted to do surface construction, but they're not permitted to do any underground mining until they've posted bond for that work. And I think the company is, is kind of waiting at this stage to see how the, the court case comes out before developing and, and making any further plans to, to go underground. So that's kind of an overview of some of the metal mines. And now I'm gonna switch gears and we're gonna talk about some industrial minerals and some of the more, uh, what I think are kind of geologically or mineralogically interesting sites in Montana. So what we're looking at here is the Yellowstone talc mine this is down here in, in southern southwest Montana, not too far from Yellowstone National Park in Idaho. Um, this is a, a large open pit talc mine. And to give you an idea of kind of the regional geology here, uh, in these blue squiggly lines, we're seeing Archean Age marbles, so very old marbles that were basically altered. There were uh, you know hot fluids, hot groundwater moving through the system. Um, and they basically altered those marbles and created talc from there. So 
We actually have three operating talc mines in Montana, the Regal, the Treasure, and the Yellowstone. And they're all kind of in this, this regional trend. Um, John Childs with CGI has done a lot of great work uh, to, to kind of delineate these potential talc zones. And there's probably potential for talc or other chlorite development kind of in the middle of these areas too. So here's an example of the talc that comes from the Yellowstone mine. Typically has this green color. Sometimes it's a bit gray. Uh, there are some areas where you have really nice, uh, you know, manganese dendrite pattern that, that fills the talc. Um, there are a few cases of, of folks that will collect this for sculpting, um, but this is really used more as an industrial talc. It goes into uh, paper products a lot of plastic production, rubber production. Um, I had no idea that talc was used in so many everyday products until I really became familiar with their operations. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, some of these dikes um, that acted as pathways for fluids probably formed during an extension event. And, and I'm going to talk a bit more about the belt basin and the belt rocks in the Northwest. But I think all of these things happen in a very similar time frame. Um, so again, this talc deposit is, is quite old. It's interesting that the Yellowstone was actually started by two different companies mining opposite ends of the deposit. They kind of met in the middle and, and formed one large pit as a combination of their, their mining operations. This mine also has a very long mine life. They've been permitted out for at least another 50 years of production. So their waste rock dump that I'm showing you here, it's being reclaimed in sequences. So as they complete one stage, they reclaim the next. Uh, and they kind of mimic the surrounding landscape as they go. There's a few other interesting rocks that come from this mine. As I mentioned, the, there's a marble host rock and it's a dolomitic marble. And in some cases that's been recrystallized and we see these very uh, dark red, very sparkly uh, dolomite. And it's, it's kind of massive. There aren't many crystals associated with it or large crystals. Um, but what's neat about this is this is a, a decorative rock or a landscaping stone that I see quite a bit uh, where I live here in Helena. A lot of the landscaping companies will purchase this rock and crush it up, and it makes a very nice sparkly uh, landscaping gravel. Uh, just next to that here, we do see some larger crystals of dolomite, and these really occur in the, some of the void spaces and fractures along the contacts around the talc. Uh, you'll see some large calcite crystals as well as dolomite crystals, and I think this specimen contains both. Um, but they, they do encounter these from time to time, and they, they try to set them aside for, for folks that are curious about the, the crystals there. Another interesting thing at this mine, on the north end of their pit, you can see kind of this tan or peach-colored lens. And this is actually a, a volcanic, uh, it's a tuff, right? So it's you know, ash material. Uh, and they're mining through this. This is just an overburden uh, waste rock layer. But this tuff is from the Huckleberry Ridge Volcanics, which is approximately 2 million years old. And this is from an eruption of the Yellowstone Caldera. And I, I found this interesting uh, map that shows the extent of, you know, kind of the ash fall or the influence from these eruptions. Uh, so the Huckleberry Ridge certainly wasn't the largest, but it was still a quite large event uh, that deposited this tuff. And if in the bottom image here, there's kind of a zoom in on the Yellowstone Park area and you see the outline of this caldera. The, the Yellowstone mine that we're looking at is kind of up here in the, the northwest corner. And there's just a few remnant pieces of, of this tuff, but uh, it's kind of an interesting thing to encounter at the top of this talc mine, which is a very old sequence. And you see some, some fairly young volcanic features. We're going to go a little bit northwest here. Uh, we're down in the bottom corner of Montana in the, uh, this is between Virginia City, which is a very famous old gold district, and Twin Bridges. This is the Alder and Ruby Valley area. And what's interesting is I mentioned this is a historic gold producer. There was a lot of dredge uh, mining going on. So if you drive through this area, it's, it's a very scenic highway, but there are dredge piles all along the, all the, along the road. And all the floodplains have basically been turned upside down due to, to dredge mining in the 1800s. But what they noticed in these dredge piles is that there were little garnets left behind, and these alluvial garnets. And so there, over the years, there were a series of mining operations where they would go in and they would screen that material and they would separate out uh, 
these garnets and they're more industrial grade. They're not very high quality gemstones. But more recently, a, a company did some exploration and they followed the trace of these alluvial garnets back to the bedrock source. So this is a garnet mine operated by GMA. It's an Australian company. And they're actually producing garnet from bedrock. And you can see the outline of the quarry here. Here's a sample of that rock. And uh, it's an Archean age. It's a, it's a biotite schist. There's a few other rock types there. There's even some granite and pegmatite dikes that contain the garnets as well. And in this, this sample, you can see all these little red kind of purpley garnets in the light colored zone. And this is actually a, a contact. There's the darker mica schist with the black biotites in there containing all the little garnets there. So basically what they do at their mill site is crush this up and using gravity and you know density properties of the rock, they're able to separate out uh, these garnets and they produce this, this material here shown in the glass jar. And this is an abrasive product. So this is used in uh, sandblasting and jet cutting. Uh, a lot of sandpaper or nail files, emery boards, those kinds of things will use abrasive garnets. And these garnets are, are special in a sense because they're not alluvial, they're not rounded, um, whereas most of the world's supply of garnet is rounded. So these have a, they're particularly abrasive because they're angular. So it's a, it's a high quality garnet for that purpose. We'll talk a little bit about sapphires. Um, here in the center part of the state is a very interesting uh, area where they produce yogo sapphires and, and Montana's famous for having yogos uh, and their nice bright blue purple color. Uh, here's an example of, uh, again, this is an operating permit, uh, but it's very different than some of the mines we've seen so far. This is all done by hand. You see the gentleman down here in the, in the bottom of the trench. Uh, a lot of this work is done by hand with ladders, uh, you know, a few buckets at a time. Here's an example of the material that they're mining here. It's a, it's a lamprefere dike. So again, this is an intrusive body. It's kind of a dark gray to green lamprefere. Um, it's about 49 million years old. There's you know, these large crystals there, um, but what they see is this, this dike also contains a lot of xenoliths and a lot of adjacent rock and things that got broken up and carried along the way uh, with this intrusion. So there's been speculation over the years about whether the sapphires formed within the intrusion or were they carried, were they plucked and, and disturbed off of uh, surrounding rocks and, and carried upwards. That seems to be the, uh, the theory right now. Uh, there's a handful of folks at the Bureau of Mines here that, that have devoted their careers to studying sapphires. And there's a, a few examples here. Uh, I don't have many examples of these yogos. They're, they're fairly expensive and uh, they don't really share those too freely. So we're, we're really fortunate to have a few samples in our, our office collection here. A little bit different, as I mentioned, you know, we have the potential for alluvial sapphires. So this is much more common. We have a few places in the state that produce these. Uh, these samples came from a site very close to Helena. There's also a site closer to Phillipsburg and the Gem Mountain area, Skalkaho Pass. And these are sapphires that have already weathered out of whatever bedrock host they're in, which is still a bit of a mystery. I don't know that folks have, have truly identified all of the source rocks for these alluvial sapphires, but there are a few operations where they go out into these sand and gravel bars and they basically screen out sapphires of, of various sizes and colors. Um, this is a bit more hobby or recreational scale mining um, and they also have places like this that are open to the public where you can go out and purchase material or buy a bucket of gravel and you can screen your own sapphires. Uh, and that makes for, for a fun day out in the field. So the rest of my presentation, I'm gonna quickly go over rock products. You know, something I mentioned earlier, um, there's various scales and types of mining associated with rock products. At the most simple level, we have surface picking. Uh, this is very common in the central part of the state or in the northern, uh, northern tier. And what we see are these small little brown divots in the photo. And these are places where they've gone around and picked these rocks up by hand and they've stacked them on a pallet. There's, these are typically uh, sedimentary rocks, uh, usually Cretaceous age, you know, siltstone, mudstone, or sandstone units. Um, and what's interesting is they often have a lichen or moss coating. 
And when I talk to some of the operators, they, they tell me that you get a higher price, uh, the better the lichen cover. So if there's different colors of lichen uh, or very thick lichen, that, that's really good stuff. And that gets a, a much higher price because a lot of the stone goes into decorative patios or fireplaces, um, kind of construction material. They may cut or slice some of this rock in certain areas to fit the dimension they need. Um, I think it is interesting though, because obviously the, the lichen is, you know, it's organic and it's going to break off. Uh, so it, it is kind of a, a temporary feature of the rock. So a, a step up from that, right? We have the surface picking in kind of a small area. Some of our operators will go to these, these edges where you see outcrops. Uh, there's drainages where this rock is exposed in sheets or plates. And this provides even more potential to go through by hand, pick up this rock. And at that stage, you can fill even more pallets and fill even more orders uh, for this decorative stone. So this is a much larger scale operation. But again, this is fairly simple. Folks that have a, a pickup truck or a, say some kind of small piece of equipment to lift and move pallets around, uh, there's definitely a low barrier to, to getting into a mining operation like this. You can get a little more sophisticated. And in this case, they're actually producing these large slabs of, of sand surface. So there'll be someone out here with a crowbar and, and they're prying some things loose. They may move some soil out of the way. And this equipment can come in and, and remove these larger slabs. We see these rocks going to large landscaping installations. You know, if there's a, a nice corporate building and they've got a big water feature and a waterfall and a bridge, there's usually some very large sandstone slabs associated with that. This next image is, is a little bit to the east in center, central Montana. And this is uh, almost like a strip mine or like a coal mining technique where they, they mine it in panels. And they basically excavate down, they produce this flat rock uh, from a particular zone. The overburden and the waste spoils are here to the side. And they'll basically push that material back into the hole. And then they'll keep mining in a sequence as they go. And then they'll reseed and revegetate the, the backfilled hole as they, as they go along. Here's an example of some of the things they produce at, at that site. Um, they produce a lot of tile, a lot of cut and shaped stone. Again, this is really for construction and, and masonry purposes, uh, but they, they have a wide range of products and colors. At this particular quarry uh, near the last photo, the rock comes out of the ground in, in almost these perfectly 90 degree plates. So they can come in here with a forklift and basically just pry the stone loose. It breaks away and, and fractures very nicely and they can stack that flat stone on pallets to be shipped. I will note that a lot of the stone is going to construction uh, in Montana, as, as well as out of state. Uh, we've had a big influx of people coming in and property values are, are really sky high right now. And very large homes demand very large rocks. So this is really a booming industry right now. We'll go back up here to the uh, kind of central or north central part of the state where we have some of these, these volcanic intrusions that are also being mined. But this isn't so much for decorative rock. This is for uh, construction material and aggregate and kind of that ballast gravel that they use on railroad lines underneath the rail lines. That's used quite fr frequently for that. So one example I'm showing here from the last image, this is a, a kind of an intrusive cone here, but this is called shunkenite and it's a, it's a very alkaline rock. It's, it's an intrusive mafic rock. Um, has some augite and, and olivine and kind of some interesting minerals in there. And the type locality for this rock is in Montana. It's a place called the Shunken Sag. So hence the name Shunkenite. And there are a few places in the state that produce this rock. It's very dense. And as I said, they use it for, uh, for railroad ballast or they've used it in riprap for dams and spillways. It's a very durable, heavy duty stone. Uh, the other sample here is a picture of dacite, again, a, another igneous rock. Uh, it's, it's often used for the same purposes. And these actually, uh, there's some hills at the north end of the state, right on the Canadian border, that are kind of a famous landscape called the Sweetgrass Hills, and those are composed of this dacite. So a lot of these, these types of operations form around what we call the Central Montana Alcalic Province. So as I mentioned, you know, the Western part of the state has all of these 
you know, fractures and faults. It's very tectonically active area. But then we see these kind of island mountain chains that kind of stick up out of the prairie. And, and these are all between, you know, say 45 and, and 75 million years old. Um, they have very interesting uh, mineralogy. There's potential gold mines, silver mines. Um, there's, I believe, even some potentially uranium deposits in the south end of the state. So there's, there's kind of an odd mix of, of rock types and, you know, mineral potential in these areas. And down here, so there's a picture of uh, some mountains near Lewistown here. And then down below is what we see more typical of the Shonkanite, where we see like a, a dike or a seam, kind of a flat top uh, butte or, or a bluff. Um, it's very common around central Montana. And here's just an image of, of one of those operations again, where they're, they're crushing the rock and they separate it into various stockpiles using conveyor belts. And uh, they'll size it according to what the market need is. Another area that's really popular for rock products is the Northwest part of the state. So basically, you know, Missoula up to the Canadian border into Idaho and further up into Canada, there's this very thick sequence of sedimentary units that we call the belt supergroup. Uh, and by no means I, am I an expert in the belt. It's a very complex uh, stratigraphic layer and there, there are folks that have devoted their careers to studying the belt. Uh, but it is, it's a very old group, you know, between one and one and a half billion years. Um, what's really interesting is a lot of it has not been metamorphosed or, or significantly altered. So there's still a lot of places where you see ripple marks uh, a lot of really nice sedimentary features are preserved. Uh, there's also a number of, of uh, stromatolites in some of these units. So again, very, very interesting rocks. And, and they really make up the majority of the peaks that you see in Glacier National Park up here in the Northwest. The sample that I'm showing you here, you can see a few ripple marks across that. Uh, I think this is from the Shepherd Formation, although there's a lot of repetition in the, in the sequence. So it's hard to know for certain. Uh, but this is actually crushed and used um, in, in highway mix. So aggregate that's used in the highway, it's really pretty. There's a stretch near Glacier National Park where the highway is red, and it's because they're using this rock as a part of their, their mix in the road. So I always get a kick out of seeing the red highway. And here's a few other examples from the Northwest. Uh, there are a lot of sites like this in the, in, in the forest where, you know, there's an exposed outcrop uh, someone will come in and pick that rock and then you'll begin a quarry. And the belt provides all sorts of different colors and textures. There will be a purple and a red and a gray quarry. And the operators will kind of move around based upon what the color demands are and, and what the interest is. Here's just another example of that. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. Uh, I apologize for having the views kind of swapped at the beginning. I'm I'm happy to go back and look at other things in larger view if people would like to see that. Uh, and I'm also happy to answer any questions. So thank you. Thank you so much, Garrett. That was wonderful. What a great presentation. Um, I, I do have a question for you. Um, so especially like for those rock products that were really on the surface. Um, so how do those types of permitting work? Is it is that usually like a, they lease the mining rights? Is that how that goes? That's usually how it works. You know, they'll, they'll be contacted by a rancher or they'll reach out and say, hey, we'd really like to lease uh, 100 acres. We'd like to go out. We'd like to surface pick this area. So there's usually a lease agreement like that. Um, there's a little catch, you know, let's say you're a farmer and you want to go out and collect rock and build a wall or basically just get it out of your field. You can do that as a non-permitted activity as the, as the landowner and the mineral rights owner. Okay. The catch is as soon as you want to start selling that rock to your neighbor, that's when it becomes a mining operation. So our, the way our statutes are written is that you're, when you sell that product, it becomes mining. So there's that kind of that fine line where we go out and we try to investigate and find folks that might be picking rock without permits. We try to understand what level of activity. Is it really small scale or are they filling up a semi-truck with pallets going to California? 
So we we try to look at all ranges of that activity. Great. So um, and I think so. I did have a question about your belt group. Sure. Is that so? It's sedimentary. So is that like a big uh, fossil, like a dinosaur fossil? It's a good question. So the belt is really old. So what we do see are some of those stromatolites, these like algae mats. Okay. But great. but other yeah. but otherwise there are not a lot of fossils uh, in the belt from that time period. And, and what was happening was the the North America craton, if you will, was separating from the Siberian one and opening up this big basin. So it was like a big sea basin that was filling in with really fine marine sediment. But this was back before there was significant life to, to get in there and disturb that sequence and create fossils. So the, the fossils that we see, the dinosaurs, the more, you know, Jurassic to Cretaceous time period that people get excited about, that's in the eastern part of the state where it's real flat stratigraphy and it's all Cretaceous sediments. Uh, but the belt is pretty, pretty slim on any kind of fossil potential. So not even trilobites or anything. No, exactly. Exactly. It was well before any of that. And then what's interesting is in Montana, we don't have any surface exposure of like, I think the Ordovician, the Silurian and the Devonian, I think are, are lacking. I don't think we have surface outcrops of, of anything from those time periods in Montana. It's all well at depth down, down below us in, in North Dakota. That's great. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Uh, Garrett, I, I have a I have a couple of questions sure. uh, for you. I, I had a chance to work with uh, work with EPA a few years ago on on uh, for hard rock mining regulation under Circle 108B. And I worked at, we had a couple of case studies in Montana. I worked with this guy named Jim Kuipers. You might be familiar with. I know Jim very well. Yeah, I figured, <laughs> figured as much. But we worked on the the Berkeley Pit as well as the Golden Sunlight Mine. Right, um, and I'm glad to see that there's been some pretty good progress uh, on on the golden sunlight. Anyhow, but what I really want to know is what's your overall opinion about how uh, the reclamation process is is going with ongoing mines? Do you find that the mining companies are, are pretty responsive? And as part of that, how are the reclamation uh, the bonding amounts determined? Those are great questions, and I I would say that the companies are more responsive now than they were say 20 or 30 years ago. Um, our bonding legislation has changed over time. So, you know, historically uh, we didn't have very clear guidance about how much bond was required. What were those reclamation standards? Is there a certain thickness for soil caps? Do you amend the soil with compost? How do you really get good vegetation? And there's been a lot of research even supported by the companies to do test plots and try to develop effective methods uh, you know, what seems to grow best, we go back and monitor those areas. So like golden sunlight, for example, uh, they can go in and grade and cap a, a rock dump, but we don't release all of the bond because uh, we want to make sure the vegetation is established for many years. So we still hold bond for those components. And the, the bonding, what, basically what we do is we look at their reclamation plan and what's been proposed and we go through uh, manually with, within spreadsheets and we calculate the cost to do all of that work. If you tell us, you know, this feature is so many acres, we calculate what it's going to take for a bulldozer to get out there and push the soil, make sure it's thick enough, uh, all, the, all the hours required, the equipment, the fuel, and we do that for every feature. We also bond for like water treatment facilities. We bond for running the pumps, the electricity, and the, the management and collecting samples to run all the water management systems. Um, so we review those annually as a, as a group. We go in and we say, okay, what's going on at the site today? Are they, are they inactive? Have things changed? Have site conditions changed? Do we revisit the bond now? And if we don't annually, we have to recalculate the bond every five years. So that's in our statute. So we're, we're revisiting these, these bond totals uh, at a minimum of every five years. But if you come in with a a permit change like golden sunlight, they brought in that new amendment to reprocess their old tailings. That also triggers a bond review. We said, okay, you want to propose a, a big change to your operation. We want to go in and, and adjust and raise the bond 
to cover whatever new things you want to propose. So that the bonds are being adjusted, uh, you know, regularly. And that's not something that occurred in the past when we saw bankruptcies and we saw conditions where the bond wasn't adequate to cover reclamation. And I think our, our operators are, they're more understanding of that. And they, they understand now that, uh, mining has, has changed and, and the, the demand for the public, the public interaction has increased over time that there's more accountability there when we all gather in a room and they have to explain what's going on, where and why. Um, and there's more overlap from other agencies. We work with Bureau of Land Management on that site quite a bit, the Forest Service on other sites. Um, and we have these other stakeholder groups that get involved, you know, citizen stakeholder groups. Um, so I think companies are recognizing that reclamation is a part of the mining process. It's not an afterthought. You have to mine and develop your plans with closure and with reclamation in mind. That's good to know. Thanks. Thanks very much, Gary. I really enjoyed your presentation. Really, Thank really you. Solid. Thanks. So just to say, I saw I saw a written question I'd like to answer real quick. Sure. Somebody asked if there are any underground mines that were tight enough to store natural gas when mining is finished. And, and I'm not aware of any. Um, I don't think we have any underground mines in areas that would produce significant natural gas. If we had any kind of fossil fuel or gas deposits, those are in, a, in the eastern part of the state. We don't really see underground mines there. Um, what we do see though is elevated radon. So like radon gas that gets into these underground tunnels, particularly in granite. So those gas concentrations will increase, but, but not anything like natural gas. So, so go ahead, um, Peggy. Um, hi, hi, Garrett. Thank you. Great presentation. Um, so the mines that are by that share um, international border with Canada, um, so how do you, like, is there any, ever any problem with like mining companies and, you know, how do you know that they're mining out of, you know, in Montana and not in Canada or likewise the other way around? I mean, and is it advantageous for them to say, oh no, we got this from Canada. I mean, right. I guess, how do you do that? <laughs> right, that is difficult. And, and that's such a remote part of the state. Um, like I said, we, we go out and do site inspections. And what's helpful about the rock products folks that we work with, they all kind of know each other and they're kind of self-policing in a sense where we'll, we'll get an email that says, hey, I think so-and-so is over here. I don't think they're supposed to be over there. And they, they kind of rat each other out in that sense. Uh, but we do also try to work with counties and we try to work with other smaller you know, municipalities and say, hey, you know, keep us informed. What are the things that you're seeing? And just trying to inform people that these permits are not expensive to get um, and they are required. So we're trying to encourage folks that if you want to start getting into rock products, you know, it, it, it is possible. There's, there aren't any really outrageous fees or barriers to doing that work. Um, I see. Okay. And, and one thing we do have to consider though is, you know, water. And so there's questions about, is there a mine in Montana that influences water that goes to Canada or vice versa? We do have examples of that where Canadian mines are impacting water coming into Montana. So there's some, there's some legal cases about that issue right now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Garrett, I visited the Berkeley pit with a geology uh, class, uh, I suppose 10 years ago. I'm pleased to hear that, uh, that it's getting better. You reported uh, lower acidity. Uh, could you discuss what contributes to that? I, at the time, I didn't think they would ever be able to clean it up. I uh, agree. That it's really interesting. And when you saw it, I'm guessing it was kind of a reddish brown color. So. Yeah. Because and, and I used to go out on a boat and I would take samples out of the pit lake. So it's, it's near and dear to my heart. Uh, five or six years ago, the chemistry really changed. And it went from this reddish brown to a blue green. And, and that's the precipitation of the iron. Um, and what caused that is the precipitation plant and the water treatment facility they have on the edge of the Berkeley pit, mm -hmm. there's a little bit of leftover lime sludge and they dispose of that sludge into the Berkeley. So over many years, 
these small additions of lime, which is very high pH, there's just enough neutralization going on that the pH has gone from like 2.5 to three to three and a half. And right now it's about just under four. So we're seeing that very slow neutralization from that lime sludge addition. And, and like I said, that pH adjustment is what dropped the iron. It also precipitated out the arsenic. So mm. I would be really curious, you know, if you were to sample the, the sediment that's accumulated on the bottom of the pit, there's probably some really interesting iron and arsenic species down there uh, that will slowly, you know, consolidate with time. And, you know, a few of the other metals though, like copper, uh, I don't think copper levels have dropped significantly. They're still circulating that water and, and leaching and precipitating copper at their, at their plant. So the, the copper levels in the Berkeley water haven't really diminished. Hmm. Because they told us at the time, what you repeated in this talk, that they, uh, they uh, uh, circulate the water over scrap iron to precipitate the copper, but that has not reduced the copper level? Not enough. They, they also, I think what it is, there's so much copper mineralization in the pit walls. It's, it's constantly leaching. There's these oh. acidic, acidic groundwaters moving through the wall of rock and almost replenishing the metal concentrations in the pit lake, if you will. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a, it's a solubility difference where the iron has dropped out, but the copper is still mobile enough to, to be in the pit lake and they can recirculate that water. And again, the, the lime sludge from the nearby treatment plant goes back into the lake, which raises the pH just ever so slightly. Mm -hmm. how, how much copper do they produce from the, uh, from the plant? You know, I, I can't give you a tonnage off the top of my head, but I have heard just anecdotally, the company had said that that pays for their electricity bill each month. And that mine is the second largest uh, power user in the state. So I mean, just frame of reference, you know, it's probably on the order of, uh, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars a month to million dollars a month in copper just from the preset plant. Um, so I'd have to run the numbers to see what the, what the, how many tons they're getting, but, but it's on the scale of rail cars and they actually have a, a uh, suspended magnet and there's an operator moving this magnet who's shifting the scrap metal from one bin to the next and there's these large concrete bins where they do that precipitation so it's at a, a fairly large scale and that's in addition to the copper that's coming out of their normal mining and milling circuit um, so that that precipitated copper is almost like an extra extra little shot of copper to their their shipments that leave the mine I mean, that, that's, that's absolutely nuts. I remember like the Berkeley pit now for everybody who doesn't know, it's actually a tourist site in a weird way. You can actually it go is. to viewing platforms and pay <laughs> to go see this gigantic polluted hole in the ground that if a bird lands in it and drinks, it dies. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> right. It's, it's $2 to get in now. It used to be free, but as you said, it's, it's been developed into more of an attraction. Uh, and now it's becoming more of a super fun cleanup story in the sense that they're they're pumping the water out and treating that water um, the other good thing you mentioned the birds they've had a number of migration events that happen where you know hundreds or thousands of geese die and that has forced them into a, a bird mitigation program so it's it's this really complicated system where they have uh, noisemakers and deterrents all around the pit in the last few years they've been able to drop fatalities to almost zero, I won't say 100%, but um, their monitoring and their identification and their, their basically their bird team has done a really effective job of, of getting birds to move on. Because really what, what kills the birds is many days on the water. If something comes in and lands and leaves within a day or two, there's really no issues, but it's that prolonged exposure that's really led to those big uh, die-offs. So, so they've had to kind of been forced into that a wildlife management aspect too. And there's a, there's a whole subcommittee that just works on bird issues for the, the Superfund program. It was mentioned that this is a tourist attraction. If you're in the area, it's worth seeing. Only two bucks to get in, but the money and your time, it's worth it. 
The other thing I, I'll, I'll put in a plug for Butte. I, I lived there a long time. My wife is from there. I, I love the town and the, and the history. There's also opportunities to go in underground mines. So on the west end of town, kind of on that peripheral zone, there are some underground mines where you can take tours. Um, and there's actually a, a classroom associated with Montana Tech, the university there. And it's kind of an underground mine classroom where they, they look at everything from uh, you know, putting in ground supports to drilling and blasting, um, and also looking at, you know, sampling and mineralogy. And there's a, a lot of opportunity for students in those open uh, mine workings. Is the sludge beneath the Berkeley pit rich enough in minerals to be a potential for future mining? That's a great question. And, and I, I think that it could be. You know, and I think that's been discussed at, at a high level that there's even some, some rare earth elements and a few things that occur at, at very low concentrations in the Berkeley water. So you could consider that in the future if this precipitated sludge is slowly accumulating these trace metals, that may be a, another potential you know, mineral product in, in the future. You would have to somehow pump that out or somehow remove the water. Um, in the, in the long term to do so. There's also some discussion that perhaps as the mine life continues, they may consider putting their tailings into the Berkeley pit and backfilling that pit. And that may provide up to 12. Twenty years of tailings disposal, which would basically be acidic lake, uh, but it would basically kind of close off any potential to get to that precipitate or the, the ore zone that's further beneath the Berkeley. So that's, that's still kind of up in the air. I don't know if that would happen in, in my lifetime. I'm also curious about the Yogo Sapphires. Um, I assume that was a small operation. So I'm guessing less than five acres, but you said it's a permitted activity. So could you comment on the scope of operations? That's right. Yeah. So that, that it's kind of an odd example. The, the Yogo dike extends through that region. Um, and historically, there have been small operations along that dike. The particular permit that we have belongs to a, it's like a homeowner's association. Um, and what it is, when you buy a home or property in this subdivision, you're granted what they call digging rights. So you kind of buy into the association that allows you to mine. So that's kind of how they set it up was that it's a permitted entity then, and I can't remember the full uh, permit area. I think it is a little over five acres though. Uh, but basically you can, there's many different folks that mine that, that area. It isn't just one, it's not even really a company necessarily. It's kind of an association of, of homeowners. So it's a, it's a good catch because it is a small scale operation. I, I don't, I think it might be just over five acres, which is probably why they're in that permitted range. But, um, but again, these, there's not a lot of fees or costs associated with getting a permit. So it doesn't necessarily exclude small scale miners or, or rock enthusiasts to getting a permit. You don't have to be a multi-million dollar company. And again, at the scale of their disturbance, they're not impacting groundwater, surface water, um, and it's a pretty localized mining area. Are there any other questions? I really appreciate the conversation. This is, uh, it's good for me to, to try to explain this to folks that maybe have never been here or don't have the stuff in their backyard. And it helps me really appreciate kind of the, the mineral variety that we do have. There's all sorts of stuff. I did a road trip across Montana collecting from mine dumps and everything. It, it's just a gorgeous place to go. And I went up to like Argo mine and um, you name it. And it was, um, it's a fun place to go. And just a, a big range. I mean, you can go all, all through uh, you know, history. And that's what I appreciate. It's all, especially in the Western part of the state, it's all been, uh, you know, smushed and, and compacted together. So you can go, you know, through very, very different units 
uh, throughout geologic time in a very short distance. You know, from one county to the next, you're in a totally different section looking at very different things. Um, and there's so many road cuts. You know, I, I really appreciate all the, the highway road cuts around here <laughs> through all the mountains. What I'm noticing, uh, Garrett, I loved your talk actually. Um, what, what I enjoyed the most is every collecting locality. That's what, what I was looking at. How can we, when can we come and visit <laughs> you, know, you and come in the, in the warm sites? months? That's when I recommend <laughs> <Yeah>. it. <laughs> hey, thank you. And okay, so we're Washington, D.C. So is all the government bureaucracy coming from Washington to you? Some of it is. And, and some of it's at the state level. You know, we have the, the federal agencies that we work with. They have the regional offices, usually in Denver or, or nearby. Um, so we have kind of that level to work through for some sites. If, it, if mining would occur on federal lands, we definitely have additional steps and other groups to work with. Um, but the permits that are on private land, they're only regulated by the state. So at least only DEQ, only my program is involved. So we only have to deal with the state level bureaucracy, um, which is a, a little better <laughs> sometimes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but we definitely see delays, you know, and if, if there's anything like a government shutdown or funding sources or things like that, those have ripples on our federal partners. And that may delay the permitting that we're trying to go through or the site inspections that we would normally do together. Um, sometimes we have to do independent work because federal partners aren't available and things mm -hmm. like that. Great. Thank you. Garrett, thank you very much. I really appreciated your talk. Um, I've only been to Montana one time and it was to go trout fishing on the Yellowstone River and it's just such a beautiful state. And you know, thank goodness for you guys. Um, as much as we need the minerals, we also need clean water and it's um, such an important job. So thank you for all that you do. Thanks.